<laughs> Mike. All right, we are streaming on YouTube. Te technology. There we go. Get rid of that. All right, here we go. Welcome everybody to another of our Better Press for a Better World uh, webinar series. I'm Jeremy Steele, the Executive Director of the Michigan Interscholastic Press Association. And I am joined by a couple of my colleagues from the School of Journalism at Michigan State University, uh, Mike Castellucci and Bob Gould, who uh, both spent many years and are still working uh, in broadcast journalism. And a couple of our recent graduates who have just started their careers in broadcast journalism. Uh, if you are joining us via Zoom live, you can use the Q&A tool to send us in questions. Uh, or if you are um, watching us on YouTube, you can use the chat to send us in questions there. And we'll ha we're happy to cover as many of those questions as possible. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Mike Castellucci, who can introduce uh, our two uh, professional journalists. Hey, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so first, uh, we have uh, uh, Ruta Olsenaida and Tony Black. And these are two former students who um, actually, I think, maybe they could shed some light on this, uh, got jobs as they were still working or still uh, working for That's us awesome. in uh, uh, broadcast journalism called Focal Point. But uh, they, can, they can add to that. Tony Black works at CNY Central in Syracuse. It's the NBC and CBS affiliate. Uh, Ruth Ellison Ida works in Omaha, Nebraska. I have to ask her about the temperature right now. KMTV, the CBS affiliate. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Tony, uh, let's, let's uh, start with you over in Syracuse. Uh, temperature right now? Uh, today is a little warmer. Yesterday we were in the 60s. Right now we're 63, but they're telling me that we're going to get more snow before Mother's Day. So, all right. So, Ruta, temperature in 63. Oh, okay. Pretty good. Okay, pretty good. Pretty, pretty similar. Uh, so, Ruta, tell us about uh, your uh, path from Michigan State to Omaha. Yeah. So, I think it was right around this time last year that I had already accepted my job here in Omaha, Nebraska. So I basically took all of April to apply, to interview, to figure out where I wanted to go. And then I, my goal was to graduate with a job so I could kind of, as soon as I graduated, kind of start thinking about the future. So I moved here June 3rd, so about a month after graduation. And I'm a reporter MMJ, so I shoot everything myself. I edit everything myself. I sometimes get a photographer if I'm lucky, which is awesome. <laughs> and yeah, and so it'll be a year in June that I've been here. And it's been a really awesome learning experience that first year. You kind of really grow because you went from making one story to maybe, you know, one story every two weeks to a couple stories a day. So you kind of get pushed into this world, but it's just such a good, great learning experience that, um, and I was surrounded by really great colleagues that kind of helped me make those mistakes if I had to make those mistakes, um, helped me learn how to do live shots, um, things on my own. So it's been, it's been great. Tony, similar uh, circumstance or how's yours different or similar? Uh, so I graduated in December, which is a weird time to find jobs because you have the holidays, um, you have budget seasons for news directors and things like that. Um, so I was interviewing with two different places um, before I graduated. And then once I graduated and really had time to like focus on getting a job, um, that's when I started flying out to places interviewing. Um, and I got offered here the job on Christmas Eve um, and then started in January. Um, so I've been here almost, what is that, three months now? Um, and similar to Ruta, yeah, it's been, you know, really great learning and making your mistakes, learning how to do different avenues, learning how to turn a story every day for, uh, for air, um, and just kind of taking everything that I learned at my time at Michigan State and really just bring that into, you know, the real world and in my community now, community now. Jeremy, do you want to jump in or do you want me to uh, 
because I've got a million questions for him if you don't. Oh, I, I'm sure you do. And um, I mean, one of the things that I'm always interested in knowing right now is uh, what's going on with your jobs right now and how has this whole um, COVID-19 issue affected the way you're doing your work at your stations? Well, I guess the biggest difference is that it's not at the station, it's at home. <laughs> so I've set up shop. I've worked from home for about, mm, I want to say three weeks now, three weeks. Uh, I have all my equipment here. I have all my chargers here. I literally have my camera right here. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so what, how I um, do things here is we have a morning meeting over the phone, over a conference line, where we um, pitch our ideas. Um, then once I know what I'm doing, I do most of my interviews over Zoom. And then if I need to get B-roll, I go out in the field. I film the B-roll with some PPE, personal protective equipment. So I've got a mask and some gloves. Um, and if I do an interview in person, it's six feet away. Um, we don't have the like boom mics because they're all sold out everywhere. So I've had to like every single interview has been a struggle as to how I mic up the person because I'm not allowed to put a lob on them right now. And so it's either me really extending my hand or I try to set it on something or I have to find ways around that, which has been a whole kind of tricky thing in itself. So um, there's things you have to work around, but it's, it's different. It's tougher, but it's almost kind of become the new norm now. So I'm getting used to it. And um, then I come back here. I edit everything here. If I have to switch some files with a photographer, we just do it out in the field. Um, so I do everything from home. Um, I, it's not, you know, the perfect situation, but it's what we've had to do. And so it's kind of worked for us and we haven't had any major, major problems. Um, for me, it's the same as well. You can kind of see, I have my setup over there. I've also been, so being in New York, we obviously have been the hardest hit state with the coronavirus. So we've been, um, our station took big precautions as soon as New York City started reporting because we're about three hours away from New York City. Um, so pretty much all of our reporters except for three. So I think we have seven reporters who are all remote now and we've been remote for about a month and a half and we'll be remote for probably the end of May. And then we have photographers that are remote. Some of our producers are remote. Some of our managers are remote. Um, so they've really taken steps because obviously we're, we're getting hit with it really hard here um, and just kind of seeing um, the after effect it's having on, on the whole state, it, you know, especially here in Syracuse, we're getting hit bad and all of our counties surrounding, we're getting hit bad. Um, so same for me, I've been remote. The only time I ever see anyone in person is like Ruta said, if I'm doing interviews with someone and still we're wearing masks, keeping our distance. Um, and then I see our photographer and we only get assigned to photographers who are also remote so that they're not going back to the station and bringing back if I am carrying it and then they bring it back. Um, so the, the human interaction is definitely very limited. Same with Ruta. I'm doing a lot of interviews um, via computer. Um, I'm able to go out and shoot footage still. Um, but even a lot of the footage we use, we try to get stuff from, you know, if they have pictures, whoever we're interviewing, um, file footage if we have to, because with like movie theaters closed, I can't go inside a movie theater and, and shoot footage inside of a movie theater. Um, so it's definitely changing how we're operating, but it, it, it's been it's been a good learning experience to, to figure out different ways to have to tackle stories. Are, are there other ways? We've got a question from somebody watching us on YouTube. And if you're watching us on Zoom, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send us in a question. Um, uh, but the, the question from over at YouTube Live is, are, are there other things about broadcasts and the way you're doing your jobs that have changed because of, of this pandemic? Um, or or is, is that kind of the main difference that you're stuck at home or you're working remotely with, you know, keeping social distance? I would say there is a lot of, there's been change. Obviously, the, the whole aspect of putting a story together for me is still the same. The storytelling aspect is still the same. Um, obviously how you're gathering that information is very different. Um, but then also the, a, a big change that's, that's kind of come with, with this is just your human interaction. You know, when you're interviewing people in person, you're able to read their emotions and, and read the scenario wherever you're at and kind of understand what's going on. And obviously that's a lot harder to do when you're talking to someone over video chat, you don't really get that personal, um, that personal connection with them. 
Um, so it, it's hard in that aspect for me, and I'm sure Ruta probably the same is is you're not you're not getting to build relationships as much as you would be when you're meeting them in, in person and, and going to wherever they may be to see what they're going through. Yeah, I'm such a people person. So this has been so hard. <laughs> I miss human interaction. Yeah, that's the one thing. You, you don't really get to spend too much time with them either because, um, well, my news director said, like when we moved out, you're making news right now. So people are informed, like, where's my stimulus check? How do I get my unemployment? He's like, don't get cutesy. Like, I don't need nap pops right now. And like, I don't need this. I just need you to get information out in a really critical time right now. And so I'm not doing you know, like my, like maybe like a nap pop or maybe, you know, like these creative, I'm doing like track, like info, soundbite, that's it. Because like how he described it is we're in the middle of a pandemic, get people really important information out. Um, and then, you know, once things start calming down, we can get back to normal, but it's definitely changed how I've done my reporting. Cause I love to, you know, and Mike taught us this, is just to put a mic on someone, follow them around, talk to them, see what they're doing, kind of spend some time with them. You can't do that. You can't even get more than six feet, you know, close to them. So it's changed how we've done storytelling for sure, or how I've done storytelling. Um, but I know it's temporary and I know this is really unprecedented times. So I think we're all just doing the best we can to make sure we're getting important information out there. I have a question um, for both of you. Uh, so we've been doing this, I don't know, four or five weeks now. Um, how's the fatigue level setting in? And I'm not, I don't mean as like, okay, this is, it's getting tiresome to do this every day, day in and out, seeing the, 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 it's depressing. And what I mean, and that's a good question too. The question I have is, you know, uh, staying fresh with the story ideas, you know, um, for a while we see, okay, every, here's, here's this group making masks and this one is doing this. And, you know, how do we, how do we do these stories, uh, you know, that are different? Um, and, and how are you able to come in each day with fresh perspective and fresh ideas? Cause it seems like, you know, after a while that it's, it tends to be repetitive. Yeah, I definitely, I, I agree with that. It's at some point with everything closed and only a certain amount of things happening every day, how can you still come with story ideas? And, and I would be lying if I said every day, I'm like, I know exactly what I want to do. Um, but here there's something that's happening different every day. Um, whereas we're able to, like right now, our governor's saying we can start to reopen things at this point. So yesterday I did a story about how our business is planning like what plans are they putting in place when they do reopen? What are they going to do? So I talked to like a restaurant, a salon and say, you know, what plans do you have? Um, but there definitely is fa fatigue with it. It's especially doing this for a month and a half. It's, it's at the point where it's, oh my gosh, how much longer can I report on coronavirus? And <laughs> I'm sure everyone in the country is thinking that same thing, but um, just, it's honestly just kind of, following what's happening in your area, what's happening in the counties surrounding you, um, talking with business owners and, you know, like Ruta said, like stimulus checks, you know, we've had problems where people can't file for the unemployment on our state website. So it's, there's always like little things happening here and there, whether it's issues with government, with business, with um, police officers not wearing masks. We had uh, something with that the other day um, that we're able to build off of, but um, I was talking with Mike about this a couple of days ago and, and Ruta mentioned it. The creative aspect is definitely taking a toll because when you're doing a story about police officers not wearing masks and I can't even go talk to them, I'm using pictures that people sent us. I can't really get super creative with that. Mm -hmm. Ruta? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely was like starting to hit a wall um, I would say last week and I was just like, you know, what am I doing? Like, how do I make things different? I feel like I'm pitching the same stuff every day. Um, and I just kind of had to like reboot myself. I also, some things changed at work where I got put on something else and I had to start making new ideas and it kind of got me excited again. So I, now what I do is I have an Excel sheet and, and I have it split up into different categories of like, um, so for my particular segment that I'm doing, I have to like figure out how to get people jobs and figure out how if make sure programs are working correctly. And I'll just kind of like sit down at the end of a day and I'll just be like, so what did I see today? What did I hear? And I have like a list of probably like 80 story ideas right now because um, something's happening every day. And even if it's on another organization making masks, they have their own history and they have their own reasons for doing it. And they have their own um, 
population they're going to reach. So I think every story is important right now. Um, and you might feel like you're a bit of a broken record because you're doing similar stories. And it is mostly, if not all, coronavirus stories. But you have to sit back and think these are not like normal times. And so you kind of, it's tough, but everyone's going through it. And um, to stay fresh, just keep staying inspired, looking at other people's work. Like Mike sends me like Boyd Hubert stuff or um, Steve Hartman. And I'm like, whoa, like that's so creative. Maybe if I did that with like my local organization. So you have to kind of just like take a breath and just think about um, that these are really weird situations that we're in and just kind of um, still try to stay inspired by what's around you. Are, are you seeing a change in the response that you're getting from your community in, in the works that, you, that you're doing? We've got a question from one of the watchers on Zoom about um, how COVID's impacted the role of broadcast journalism. But I'm just wondering too, building on that, what kind of response are you getting to your work from folks in the community? Is that different than what it might've been two months ago? Yeah. Um... I'm noticing for stories, which all journalists to me should be trained for this. And I think Michigan State did a good job of doing this. That is always present both sides of the story. Um, so when we do that, those pieces don't necessarily get as much backfire. But I think in today's like this, where you have very different political parties, um, people look at people look at things, schools being closed. Some people blame the president, some people don't. So if we're going to report you know, schools are closed for the end of the year or whatever it may be. You have people who are saying, you know, that's our president's fault. And you have people saying, no, that's, that's not our president's fault. Um, so I think this scenario it, with circumstances that happen every day and, and come about every day, it definitely um, shows how divided we are in certain aspects and how people um, have to understand all of the facts and they need to be presented all of the facts so that they know the entire story of, of what's happening. And, and at, then at that point, they can make their decision as to who they favor or don't favor. Um, but we definitely have been getting, um, you know, good reviews of people saying, I like how you guys are covering this. I appreciate you guys are, you know, covering this and going out there every day and telling these stories. But then you have people that are saying, you know, coronavirus isn't that bad. You know, why are they making, they just can't, they're, they're talking about canceling the New York State Fair, which is here in Syracuse. Um, and some people are saying, well, what's the point of doing that? So you have different, different opinions on everything that, you know, it's like I said, you present your facts and let them make their decision. But um, it's just a, it's a weird time we're in and everyone's kind of feeling that. Well, that was like strange to see in the beginning. People were really upset at the media when we first started reporting. Um, like I remember being on the CDC call and it was, and I was on that call every single day for weeks. And it, it was just such a different tone. This call, they were like, okay, so uh, just make sure that everyone has a plan if schools close. Um, if, you know, every, every business shuts down, make sure you have a plan with your boss. And we're like, everything's shutting down. We're like, whoa. So then we started reporting, just try to get in contact with your school, see what happens if they shut down. And that's when people got really upset at the media. They're like, why are you trying to scare us? saying the schools are going to shut down like how dare you and we're like we're just kind of telling you what the national you know organization is telling us we're just the mouthpiece and that was a really weird shift to see in the beginning because I definitely saw more like we hate the media but now that everything's kind of come into fruition everyone's kind of just reached out to us for help. So it's like, why, why haven't I gotten my stimulus check? People are reaching us um, for questions. And then, so it's kind of become more of a help me um, situation now. We've been doing pieces to answer a lot of those questions for people because um, there's a lot of people without jobs. The city of Omaha has already lost hundreds of millions of dollars with canceled events. Um, businesses that depended on some of those events are going under and so they reached out to us you know how do we file for unemployment how do we and so now we've become more of like a helper for the community and we feature different restaurants that are still open just for carry out and so we kind of do like a we're open Omaha thing um, and so we've become um, really like a self-help show now about how people can find um, these resources in a weird time. Have, have either of you been able to do any stories that aren't coronavirus related in the last few weeks? <laughs> Maybe like one or two. <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of one. I've done like stories about golf courses, but obviously everything ties back to coronavirus somehow. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, I haven't been. I, I think I did like time. one crime, like one homicide or something, and it wasn't coronavirus related. And then I think I did something. I can't even remember. <laughs> but maybe like one or two. Mike, you had a question. Uh, well, it, it was more of a, a comment on Ruta's um, answer, and that is, you, you know, local TV stations are, uh, you know, they're there to serve the community. And now um, people have, I think maybe the trend is that they're coming back to local TV. Ratings have never been higher um, or they haven't been in a long time. And a lot of, a lot of viewers are tuning in to local news again uh, because they're getting the information that they need uh, in this historic moment. So I think, and, and Tony and Ruta might not have um, any background to know what it was like before in this business, but um, it's a good time for them to be in it. Uh, it the viewership has never been bigger. What they're doing has never been more important. And after this is gone, Jeremy just asked the question of, have you done any stories that aren't coronavirus related? Um, there'll be a time soon in this business um, that the kind of content that the country will need uh, to heal is are the are the human interest stories that that we all love to do and to share and to experience and to push forward in the right direction. So I, I think we're all and will and are craving the good of the human spirit uh, to enjoy you know beautiful words and less negative discourse. Uh, we want peace and joy after all of this. And I think all of that um, uh, is, is a good thing for young journalists, all the journalists, all the TV journalists in, in the country. What, what, and this maybe is a question more for Mike and Bob, but what, what are you all seeing in the, the job market and the opportunities, at least in the short term going forward for um, young people who are looking to get into broadcast journalism. I can start with that. I, I, it, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, we we have we have a couple of grad graduating seniors, uh, three or four now that have already gotten jobs. Uh, and you know, there are jobs out there. A lot of them are on hold. I mean, it's, a lot of jobs are on hold at the moment. Uh, but we are seeing that there is a market because, uh, I mean, people like Mike said, the viewership is up and I think the jobs are, 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 are there and people need to be hired. Um, now the problem may get into where news directors don't have time to actually look through the resumes and, 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 you know, get people interviewed. But I think if you go on and look at some of these websites um, uh, where their jobs are posted, you'll see that there are jobs available. Um, but it's, it, I don't think it's going to be any easier um, I mean, right now, I mean, it, it, I think it's going to be a little bit harder. Um, and I don't know, Mike, you might have more um, on that. Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen it all across the board. I've seen uh, producers from our program get hired. Uh, and in fact, um, two of them are heading to the East Coast as we speak. I've seen an MMJ um, get hired in Texas. She's on her way to Amarillo. Um, so I, I think there's, and th these are um, mostly uh, smaller markets. I think in, in the case where I work, uh, budgets are at zero, advertising budgets are nil. And so- Sales. The, what's that? Sales are down. Sales. So while viewership is up, nobody's buying the product. Um, so I think there's going to be um, a harder road for um, some of the TV stations um, to maintain what they have right now uh, until, or maybe they'll never get back to the, the level that they were before this. But who knows? I mean, um, it's just it's unprecedented. Nobody's ever gone through this ever. So uh, who knows what's going to happen? And I'll, and don't forget, you know, this year started out to be uh, projected to be really great uh, sales wise, you know, revenue is is based on ad dollars and uh, you have two things going for you uh, an election year, uh, where spending was way up this year. 
Uh, and um, of course the Olympics um, is usually a very, very big part of the year. So Olympics have been moved now uh, and the election has been basically put on hold, um, you know, especially now um, where the candidates aren't campaigning and it's down to one Democratic candidate who's, you know, Joe Biden is likely going to get the nomination. So um, all that spending has been completely cut, cut back and, you know, where we were inundated with all the political advertising, now there's nothing. Uh, and, you know, we see a lot of uh, commercials for, uh, for Domino's and other takeout kinds of places, um, you know, that, that because it's just the spending isn't there. So it's kind of a, a hard place to be right now where, where the viewership is way up, but the ad spending is down. So. What are, are, are there tools, Tony and, and Ruta, that you're using more now than, um, than you had in the past in your work, or maybe that you're using, that you're relying on that you didn't have to use before? What are, what are some of the technology changes um, that you're facing as you try to do more work remotely or with greater social distance? Yeah, um, you heard of a mojo kit? <laughs> yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff people, on our maybe iPhone. people didn't maybe people don't know what a mojo kit is. Why don't you explain it? Yeah. Uh, we all got a mojo kit. Um, a mojo kit is a little kit that basically is your all everything you need to shoot on an iPhone. So you get a microphone, a little tiny tripod, um, a little light, um, and basically everything you would need for a full-size camera with just your phone so it the quality is great um we go live from our phones so you can set it up you can get a little light going you can go live really easy um and i've noticed that before i had my mojo kit and i was going live people had trouble hearing you need a good mic in there so um i've been using my mojo kit a lot to go live because as i'm doing as i'm filming a story for something and i'm interviewing maybe someone uh like a child psychologist who's giving advice for parents, how to maybe explain this to their kids a little better, why they're not going to school, why they don't get summer camp anymore. And so my news director was like, this is just pretty good if we just went live with it just so people could tune in. And we had 800 people tune in and all these questions. And so I set the Mojo kit up, I went back to the camera, filmed my stuff for my story and we were getting questions from the phone. So I was kind of going online and also shooting for my story for later in the day. So, um, so I've been using Mojo kits a lot and it's been really, really handy. <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't know if it's so much technology for us. Um, I, we have been using um, like our transfer software so that I can send my stuff back to the station. And the station can send me stuff. But um, to me, our biggest tool that we're, um, we're really having to utilize is communication. Because for all of us being remote, I don't know what's going on inside the station. I don't know what managers are talking about. I don't know what producers are talking about. I don't know what our anchors are talking about unless they communicate that with us. Um, and same vice versa, they don't know what I'm doing unless I'm emailing or calling them and telling them what I'm doing. Um, so that's really what we've been trying to hound on is, um, is communication so that we in the field know exactly what they, what they want from us back in the station. Um, so that's probably been the biggest tool that we've had to utilize here is we have a, we have a large team cause we do NBC and CBS, um, so we pretty much have, we have people for both producers, reporters, anchors. So we have a big team. So we have to communicate really well with each other just so that we're all on the same page. It's hard when like 50% of our staff or more than that is remote now, um, actually way more than that. Um, so that everyone knows what is happening inside that station. I wanna add something on the Mojo kits too. So when I first um, got the job, I didn't use them too much. I didn't really play with them too much in college. I never took your uh, iPhone class mic. I don't know why, but I was really scared to because it's a whole other thing that I was just really scared to touch for some reason. Like I was like, I know how to use this MMJ camera. This is my comfort zone. I don't want to try something new. I don't want it. I don't know how to like get the files on the computer. I was just scared. And then because I was kind of forced to now use it, um, and it's and like, don't be afraid because it's out of your comfort zone because now I've added a completely new skill set to my toolbox. And so it was uncomfortable to try something new. And it was maybe I had to spend like a little more time getting used to it, but now it's so easy. And now it's like, oh no, my camera broke. Well, I have my mojo kit and I'm, and I know how to use it. So 
Um, if something seems like it's a little off-putting or it's new, it's supposed to feel uncomfortable. That means you're like learning something new and it's, you know, <laughs> you're trying something different, which is good. That means you're growing. So I would just say, don't be afraid if something is out of your comfort zone. Jeffrey Rock, yeah. your boss, one of the first uh, um, people to use um, mobile journalism in the in in broadcast journalism here in this in this country. He's he's been an innovator for a long time. Yeah, and he's my news director. So, <laughs> shout out to Jeffrey Roth, Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> what um. Tony, you mentioned you you work for a station that um, you do work for two different networks, right? The NBC affiliate and the CBS affiliate. What's that like in practice? Um, is it different from a station like Ruda's that's, that's just one affiliate? Yeah, and I actually I'm pretty grateful that we do too. So we also do the CW, but we only do one show for that um, at 10 o'clock. Um, but I'm actually pretty grateful that I work for that because that increases my opportunity to go live. Um, usually I'm live three times, um, three times a day if I, I'm night side. So I'll, report, I'll be live at 10 and then live at 11 on both stations. But sometimes we're in the early shows as well. So the five, 5.30 and six, and we're live on both stations for all of that. So sometimes I can go live 10 times in one day, in one shift. Um, so I actually think it's been very helpful to be able to do things two times because it, it lets me practice going live way more. If I mess up on one, I can, you know, really get on myself and say, correct it for the other one. Um, so I think in terms of that, it's being able to do two, two of the two big stations and being able to do twice the amount of lives and, and different things like that is actually allowing me to get more comfortable quicker, um, and kind of get used to things changing fast because sometimes my hit will be on NBC at 601. And as soon as I switch over, they switch my programming to CBS and the anchor, I can hear them tossing to me and then I have to start all over again. So it's also just very much like, you know, staying on top of things, not getting overwhelmed, understanding where you're at, what's going on. And like I said, communication is huge with that um, because we have two different, two different uh, control rooms, two different studios, four different anchors. So they just have to, you know, it's a lot of talking and just understanding what's happening. A lot of young journalists at the high school level and even at the college level sometimes are just figuring out what fields in the industry they want to get into. Um, are the way that, that you do your jobs at a TV station different from maybe how you see journalists at, at your local newspapers working? Um, so we are actually partnered with the Omaha World Herald, which is the main newspaper here in town. So we're in constant contact with the, um, the newspaper team. Um, and honestly, no, we're all still at the same stories. We're all still asking the same questions. Um, behind the scenes, obviously the work is different because then they go back and they write and we go back and we log. So, but the reporting is still different, or I'm sorry, the reporting is still the same. Um, we're still asking questions. We're still trying to get information. And I worked at state news at school before I figured out I wanted to kind of go more into broadcast. And the reporting is basically still the same. I would say maybe newspapers um, have maybe like a little more time to get a good story going. And it's more, um, there's more meat to it. Whereas, and you know, if I have to do a day turn, I really can't make this interview last too long. I got to go run and get this other shot. So um, sometimes the newspaper stories are much more meat filled. Maybe they had an extra day or maybe they just had more time to write, but um, they do really great work here at the Herald and we're in constant communication, helping each other out with stories. So it's still reporting at the end of the day. And so we're still kind of, we have the same base level. Um, I can't, we don't have, we have, um, a Syracuse.com, which is, I think they started as a newspaper, but now they're, they're an on pretty much an online newspaper. And same thing with, with what Ruta said, they're always at our daily um, county coronavirus briefings. Um, they're still covering everything the same we are. Um, but to, you know, to Ruta's point, the avenue that they're doing it is different. But at the end of the day, we're all still having to work to, to put something out there um, to, to inform everyone as to what's happening. Let's let's talk a little bit about kind of the career side and how how you both got to where you're at in your jobs. Um, 
Is, is there, and I know you, both of you are pretty new to the professional side of the business, but is there something that you have learned since you started at your stations that you wish you would have known when you were students back at Michigan State? Yeah, I would definitely say um, don't get down on yourself every day because sometimes I just, I have to, I have to get a piece on air. If my time slots, if my piece airs at 10.02, that piece has to be in at 10.02. Is it going to be my favorite piece? Am I going to walk away at the end of the day and say, I loved that one? No, I couldn't tell you how many nights I stay up at night and I'm just like horrible piece. I sit there and I nitpick a million things about it. I say, I hate this piece. Um, but then the next day I'm turning a piece that I actually loved. Um, so I think in that aspect, it's different is, um, now where you're turning something every day and it, like everything, if you're producing that many things, not everyone is going to be great as much as you would love for everyone to be stand out. Um, sometimes it's just been a crappy day. No one's getting back to you. You got something last minute. You just have to throw something together and get it on there. So I would just say, um, understand that there's going to be challenges. You have to, you have to cope with and you have to um, sometimes just settle with, but understand that tomorrow's a new day, brush it off. I mean, I couldn't even tell you the story I did. What's today? Wednesday? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't even tell you the story I did Monday unless it stood out to me. Um, <laughs> what year is it? <laughs> <laughs> because every day you're producing something new and you might not have liked yesterday's, but try hard to make up for it and like today's. Yeah, totally agree with Tony. Not every day is gonna be your most creative, most interesting piece. Uh, like a photographer at my station says like, sometimes you just gotta pay the bills, like just get it in and just get the story out there. Um, but that, and then I guess for me, I just wish I would have known maybe like the culture difference of like being a student and then being like a real life adult. I moved here and I was like, what is this? <laughs> it was just so different and so, I wish I maybe would have, would have prepped myself more for that. I was like, oh, so I work like 10 hours a week or yeah. 10 hours a day. And then I don't do anything afterwards. Like, that's strange. And I got down on myself. I was like, I don't have any friends. And I don't have a life. But now I do. <laughs> um, it was just, it's like going to be a tough transition. This is such a big step from school to a real life job. It's just, um, it's going to be a little tough and you're going to find your niche, but give it a couple months and you'll make your friends and you'll make, um, you know, you'll find what suits you. Um, that was, that transition was tough for me, but I'm better now. So there's hope. It's a really you know, you, too. I think it's hard because, so I moved here in January um, and we started getting hit, I think around mid-March. Um, and then by the end of March, I was remote. So I didn't have a whole lot of time to kind of get to know the city, get to meet people um, because A, we're the snowiest city in America. So January, February, it's, you just, no one's outside. Um, so it, I'm, I'm excited to get back to normal so I can kind of kick back off where I left off. Um, it's, it's starting to get nice outside. So I'm seeing more people outside. I'm ready to go and meet other people. But, you know, it was something that I wanted to move away and see what else was out there. And I'm proud that I've done it so far. And and kind of get to see what else is out there. To Ruta's point, kind of prep yourself to, to explore something different because I learned that Michigan is different from New York. New York is different from, from Nebraska. Everything's different. Um, so you just kind of have to cope with and, and learn and adjust to where you're, well, you'll, well, you're, where you'll be at. Um, but it, it, I'm happy that I've tried it. Yeah, you should commend yourselves um, because both of you um, you know, we're, we're okay with leaving what you knew and going someplace completely different where you knew absolutely no one. And I think uh, that in this business, in the broadcast TV business, you know, I'll never forget, maybe this is a little harsh, maybe I shouldn't say this. <laughs> say it, say I'll it. Say it in, I'll say it anyway. Uh, when I was younger than you and I was an intern at a TV station in Denver, um, really, uh, looked up to this uh, reporter and I asked him, uh, uh, actually I asked him and her uh, uh, what the biggest thing that they could tell me, uh, what the biggest, um, what the best thing that they could tell me about getting into this business. And they said, don't get married. That was the first thing that they said. And now that's, you know, 
And so, but if, if, you, if you take that out, it's because you, um, you want the freedom to be able to move around when you're young and find where you want to to work I don't know I, I mean I don't know if that's a... no remember we went to the Lansing station uh, on a tour and we asked them and the first thing they said was don't make dinner plans <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, uh, hmm. and so because it's important I mean you you guys went uh, found great jobs where at, at places where you wanted to maybe um, look at things a little different and you're doing it. You're looking at different places of the country, and and you have to do that in this in this business for a while. And so, um, I think anybody that's getting into this business needs to know that, that they should be flexible enough to be able to move anywhere. And to that point, um, I think you brought up a good a, a good point with that is um, when you're going to go wherever you're going to go in the country. Um, and I looked at focal point as the same thing with this. So say I here in Syracuse, I now, uh, I'm the only person here from Michigan, but I have people from New Jersey, from Alabama, from California here. And then I look at when their contracts are up, if they decide to leave, what states are they going to next? So really you're, the more you're in this and the more you're getting to meet people, the more you're you know someone in everywhere. I mean, same with focal point. I mean, look at the people who graduated. I know we have a, I know someone who's in Wyoming, someone who's in Connecticut, um, Texas, you know, you, you just get to know people everywhere. And um, while, you know, you may not be looking to settle down wherever you're going. Um, it's nice to know that wherever you go next, likely you'll know someone or know someone who knows someone in that area that can kind of help you kick off um, and get, get the ball rolling to get used to the area and meet different people. It's a Jesse yeah. lifestyle. And, and if you and if your goal is to, to, you know, not be too far from family. Um, so take a couple, three years to, to be away. You know, there's, this is, there's no better time to explore the country and, and see different things and see different places and learn about the, the country and the geography and, and different cultures. And uh, you know, and so I always, you know, Mike and I always say this, you know, just, um, take a leap of faith. I mean, it's a couple of years, you, you the two year contract, maybe a three year, but usually a two and, uh, and try and um, find a place that will be your niche. Uh, so that then you can, if you ultimately want to come back, there's, you know, uh, several TV markets in Michigan, uh, if that's where you're from, uh, where you can from smallest to largest markets, uh, where you can, you can come back and thrive. So it's just up to you on how you want to uh, achieve all that. The interesting thing about moving to somewhere totally different, though, is that when I did it, I was just like, yeah, you just got to do it, you know, and then I tell people, yeah, I moved here, didn't know a soul, and people here are like, what? Like, you must be crazy, yeah. like, what do you do? I was like, yeah, I'm a reporter, I just moved here, I, like, didn't even see my apartment before I got here, I had to get here in three weeks, they're like, you're incredible, like, people, <laughs> this is not, like, you know, people don't usually graduate and then move and who knows where, so it's commendable that, you know, people do it, and you should do it, and um, it'll more than likely make you grow as a person if you try to get out of your comfort zone again. And you, when, you know what's, you know what's, sorry, Jeremy, what's really great right. is, is when you go to a, a new city in this business, you learn that city faster than any but he could possibly, you know, if you went moved to a city and you worked at, I don't know, uh, a bank or something, you're probably going to find a place close to the bank and you're not going to get out of that area. But in this business, um, I mean, you learn the streets, you learn the area, you learn the, uh, the way people act and it's, uh, and all of the players in it. And it, it doesn't matter how big a, or small a city is, you'll know that city. And you can go back in five or 10 years and you'll know that city. Yeah. When, when you two were starting to look for your first jobs, what was most intimidating to you about that process? Leaving home for me. Um, the thought that I was going to have to move away from Michigan where I spent my whole life. Um, but I, you know, I knew I wanted to get out of Michigan and I love Michigan, but I just want to see what else was out there. And I, I want to get back to Michigan one day, but I said, I'm 21. When I graduated, I was like, I'm 21. I don't really have any, besides my family and friends, I'm not married. I don't, you know, there's nothing really holding me back from going and exploring other parts of the, the country. Um, so I think the most intimidating part was just 
the concept of, okay, this is going to be an adjustment. I'm not going to be around family and friends for two years, but then also understanding um, I can drive home in six hours. I can fly home and be home in two hours. Um, so there's always ways to get home, to have people, you know, come out and see you. Um, but that was probably the biggest understanding was to, to, to move. Um, my biggest or the biggest intimidation I had was being alone in a new city. And then uh, also just being like the new guy at work, being the youngest at work, and still the youngest at work. I just felt like I had to prove myself. Um, and so my work ethic had to be like out of this world. And they're like, oh, you want to stay and do this extra thing? And I'm like, yes, because I feel like I have to. <laughs> and so I did all the extra stuff and I worked my butt off. Um, and that, and I, I feel like I had to do that because people were kind of expecting me to be like, oh, it's just like a college student. I don't even know if she knows what a VOSAT is. So I felt like I had to really, really prove myself and make really creative pieces. So. And that doesn't change, by the way, uh, that doesn't change after six months in this business. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you a quick story. Coming, I worked in Los Angeles and I was moving to Dallas. And after I moved to Dallas, so that's market two to market five. I found out from a coworker after I got to know him a little bit that uh, everybody hated me because, <laughs> because they had this thought of me coming from Los Angeles and they, they didn't want to talk to me. They didn't know. And I had no idea. And he, they said, uh, and, and until I proved myself again, I've been proved, trying to prove myself for 30 years. Um, it's, uh, that's that's it. I mean, you, it's a constant state of of that. I think in this business. Yeah, I think okay. that's important too because I, you know, when you when you're trying to prove yourself, um, there's there there are a lot of students that uh, go work in their first jobs, and um, you know, they Mike and I have a have a curriculum where we really push the students and we we teach high level work, and and um, I think there are other places that that um, you know where they see people get jobs and they're maybe not as skilled. Uh, and so our students will go in there and try it with an attitude and we'll, they'll say, well, you know, this photographer, how come you're not shooting on a tripod or how come you're not using a lavalier microphone and, and this and that. And, and I always tell the students, okay, look here that you may think, you know, more than they do. They've been there longer. You have to just kind of chill out, let, let them earn the, you know, let, let you, let them gain your respect. And then, and then eventually they'll see it, but it's, it's hard. It's a hard place to be at sometimes when you feel like, I think I know what I'm doing. Um, but you have to let that whole process, um, you know, take, take place if you will. So. Do you all remember what your first day or your first week was like at, at your station? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my first week was just training and it was, so Nebraska and Iowa had really, really devastating flooding in March. Um, and I came in June and it was the aftermath of that. So my first story that I went out with a reporter on and I just saw homes underwater and I was like, whoa, that was my first week and I was training and I was, and they were like getting in this water and I mean, street signs are underwater and businesses are underwater and it smelt so weird and I'll never forget it. And I was just like, okay, so this is like very real. And these are, this is not a joke. <laughs> we're here, we're in it. And yeah, and so I was like, okay, I have to, like, this is serious. We're doing really serious work right now. And I think my first, like a lot of stories were flood related. Um, yeah, so that was really, really intimidating. It was big for me. Uh, my similar to me, my first week was training and and all that. But then I start get, I started getting sent out on stories because I was the available reporter. My um, one of my first things I got sent on was we had a uh, Syracuse University student who drowned in a river, and his family was coming to identify the body, and I had to go talk to them before they went in to to do that. So I had to interview the dad and the cousins and all of them, and that was I think my. I think that was my first piece that I was set out, sent out on. So to Ruth's point, it was, you're like, oh, it's, it's real. It's time to go. I mean, I had to go talk to these people who are going to identify their family member. And it was definitely an adjustment. It was like in my headset, I was trying to comprehend, okay, I have, you know, I have to do this. I, 
I have to ask the right questions. I have to have to have the right attitude and tone with them. I have to be respectful. I want to make sure that I do what the station would like me to do and get what the station wants me to get. Um, but then it just kind of started, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it, the more, you know, you don't think about things like that. You just think, okay, I'm doing this story. This is who I can reach out to these people, you know, yada, yada, who can I do? What angle can I take? Um, so with time, it, it, you get more comfortable with it. What, I would say one more thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Drew. go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, the one thing that um, somebody gave me really good advice on at work was don't get comfortable. So my first couple months, I started kind of like finding my niche and I was like, oh, this is good. And then there was another guy at work. He's also an MMJ. He's about, been there about a year. And I noticed that morning meetings, he wasn't really pitching stories. He's like, well, what do you guys want me to do? Like, what are you thinking? Um, and so he got like comfortable and his stories were getting really kind of like bland. So he literally got let go. And that, that was kind of like, whoa, like I might be here a couple months now and whatever, but you cannot get comfortable. Like make sure you're on your toes and make sure you're looking for story ideas and make sure you're trying your hardest. Um, because if you fall into a, oh, I'm, I'm here now, I made it. It's like, no, like don't get comfortable and um, keep trying. What, what, what career goals do you two have? Where, I'm assuming you're not going to be, it's not in the nature of TV news that you're going to be in the same place where you, you know, have your first job. Where are you hoping to go as your careers continue to develop? That's a hard one. And I think I realized that once I got here is, um, I love where I'm at. I, do I want to stay here? No. Um, ultimately, I would like to get back to Michigan and be around family, but some of my point, there's so many things I want to do before then, or sometime in my life, I've always wanted to work in Florida or North Carolina and be on the coast. I'm a big water person. I mean, all my pictures up there anyway. Um, <laughs> so like, there's just things that I've always wanted to do that really, I don't, I always look to the future what's next for me, but sometimes I just have to like sit down and, and say, okay, you're here for two years. Let's get comfortable here. Let's learn everything you can hear about this area and, and really take in what you came here for and then worry about that once it gets closer to that. Um, but I mean, I, I want to get back by family, but there's other things in my life that I would like to do at some point. I don't know when it will be, but at some point that I would like to venture out and try. Yeah, I thought I knew. I don't. <laughs> um, so I'm, a, I'm very open to possibilities and stuff my family is from Europe so my it's my mom my dad my brother in Michigan so Michigan like isn't our home so we're very open to like moving wherever because um because we're down for whatever but yeah I have no idea I thought I did and I don't so I'm hoping I'll figure it out <laughs> <laughs> what what other advice do you have for journalists who are are just getting started in high school or, or looking to get into to broadcast? Is there like one piece of advice that, that you think is most important for them to focus on right now? In college and high school, I would say, take advantage of all of the resources that you have where you're at. Um, because at State, I had all of you guys, I had professors I, who spent years in the industry and just taught me so much. But once I got here, not to say you're on your own, but you're on your own. You know, you're, they say, here's your story today. Go shoot it, go write it, um, and make your slot. So I really, you know, it's hard because you don't have Bob who's saying, you know, shoot like this, get these great shots. And you don't have Mike who's saying, you know, you should write this way and make it flow that way. So you really don't have the resources that you did. You definitely have your managers and other anchors and reporters who are there to help you but they don't have an hour to set, to spend writing your, looking at your package script and looking at your editing and, you know, different things like that. Um, so definitely just take advantage of everything that you get to do while you're in college or high school, wherever it may be, because um, at some point you're off on your own and you have to, that's where you take everything that you've learned and implement it into what you're actually doing. My advice, and I think this goes for all ages, is just have a strong work ethic. Um, so whether that's being in high school and your teacher 
um, asks who wants to pick up this project, like be the first one to put your hand up. And when you're in college and you have to miss maybe a party to go and you know film something or get a story idea or organize or log, do it because there's gonna be a party the day after. So, um, and even now, I feel like you can outwork you know, the guy next to you. So as long as you work hard, really there's like no limit to what you can accomplish. So just work really hard and um and yeah it gets tiresome but then like take a bubble bath like me and all my problems go away basically <laughs> nothing nothing beats a good bubble bath <laughs> nothing i'm telling you guys <laughs> you, you know from a teaching perspective um i i i like to tell students that you know don't get into this for the wrong reasons um if you if you're doing it just to be on tv i think that's the wrong the wrong message or the wrong thing um it's it's if you like to tell stories if you like to write uh, if you like to interact with people and tell their interesting stories, uh, if you like to hold the powerful accountable and, you know, realize how important journalism and journalists are in the society, I think that's, that's what you have to understand. And, uh, and a lot of, you know, it's a, that's a, that's a, a very sort of adult way of thinking sometimes because you don't know at 17 years old or 18 years old even. Uh, so, you know, you, you have to kind of look at it from a lot of different ways and say, it's an interesting field. You get to meet a lot of people. You get to see a lot of really amazing things. It, there are there are bad days where you have to you know console a grieving family, uh, but there are great days where you just meet very very interesting people and 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 learn a lot uh, and and you get to see the world. So um, you know you take the good with the bad, but it really is a a, a great place to be and a great thing to do um, when you're when you're trying to decide on, on a different career. And I'm sure Mike has similar thoughts on that. Yeah, just incredible opportunities in this business, and uh, you, uh, and the the upside of maybe moving from city to city is that you get to see and experience the entire country, and you get to meet incredible uh, people. Um, sometimes celebrities, most of the time, um, just ordinary people with extraordinary stories. And so for me, that's the and I know for Ruta and Tony, that's it's the it's the same uh, thing that drives them. But uh, I'm gonna. I, I looks like we're we're out of time, and I've got a party and a bubble bath to go attend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Ruta and Tony. Good luck to you both on your Thank you. adventures. Go green. Go um, white. Thank you also to my colleagues, Bob Gould and Mike Castellucci. It is wonderful to see your faces, even if we're separated by many miles in the internet. So um, thank you everybody for, for tuning in today. And we will see you on our next uh, episode when we continue to look at the world of journalism and media. Thanks everybody. Bye guys. Good luck. Bye. Bye.